Hello class, welcome to lecture 18 and in this lecture we're going to talk a little bit more about cyclones and take a look at the life cycle, a typical life cycle of a cyclone and also uh, the anatomy of the cyclone. So that's going to be the main topic for this lecture. And to start things off we'll take a look at some types of cyclones and also some definitions that you can run into whenever you're talking about cyclones uh, in the field of meteorology. So uh, first thing that uh, the first thing that we're going to introduce the idea of an extratropical cyclone, and this is typically uh, this is also can be referred to as a baroclinic cyclone because it typically occurs in the mid latitudes, and it's usually something that forms as a result of the temperature imbalances between the polar regions and the uh, equatorial region and the tropical region, I should say. And uh, we'll talk. This is going to be primarily what we focus on during the course of this class, but we will uh, also touch on the idea of a tropical cyclone, which is uh, more or less related to hurricanes. Another type of cyclone that you can deal with is a subtropical cyclone, which has a lot of characteristics of a tropical storm or a hurricane, but it doesn't quite have all the characteristics, so we just refer to those as just subtropical cyclones. We won't really, we won't really be covering subtropical cyclones during the course of this class, but we will briefly talk about tropical cyclones, which is uh, something that uh, is very common around this time of year in the summer. And by tropical cyclones, we're referring to something that's either a tropical depression, a tropical storm, a hurricane if you're off the coast of the Americas, or a typhoon if you're off the coast of Asia. And another cyclone that you can have in the atmosphere is a polar cyclone, but we won't be talking about those during the course of this class. And then also uh, a special type of extratropical cyclone, which is called a Shapiro-Kaiser cyclone. And this will be something that we also cover during the course of this lecture. Uh, these can be these are actually quite interesting and uh, also somewhat rare in comparison to a standard extratropical cyclone, but we will talk about that once we get to Shapiro-Kaiser cyclone. And a couple other definitions that kind of tie into uh, the idea of cyclones. A term that sometimes you'll often hear uh, mention is a bomb cyclone, and this is something this is used to refer to a cyclone whose central pressure drops at least 24 millibars in the course of 24 hours. And usually a bomb cyclone will be something like a tropical cyclone that's rapidly intensifying, but you can also get extra tropical cyclones that, including Shapiro-Kaiser cyclones, that also can be classified as a bomb cyclone. And again, they, uh, for something to be a bomb cyclone, the minimum central pressure has to drop by at least 24 millibars in 24 hours. And you can also have something that's referred to as a bomb anticyclone, which is uh, usually referred used to refer to as a high pressure system whose minimum central pressure, or maximum central pressure, I should say, rises at least six millibars in the course of 24 hours. But of course, the main thing that we're going to focus on is the idea of cyclones. So we won't really talk about anti-cyclones because the weather with those is just not very interesting, usually. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the life cycle of a typical cyclone. And we're using something called the Norwegian cyclone model, as indicated at the top of the screen here. And the whole idea behind the cyclone is, again, it's that imbalance between that imbalance in temperatures between the tropical regions and the polar regions. And in the mid-latitudes, which is between about 25 and 30 degrees north and also up to 60 degrees north, where you have that interface between really warm and really cold air, Mother Nature does not like that imbalance. So it's going to try and bring the warm air toward the colder air and uh, also try to bring the colder air toward the warmer air to try and uh, eliminate that imbalance that's present in the atmosphere. Of course, Mother Nature is never going to succeed with that. If she ever did, then we would never have any cyclones at all in the atmosphere, and the atmosphere would just get really boring, and we'd all lose our jobs. So fortunately for us, uh, that's never going to happen, at least not in our lifetimes. And usually the way that usually the way that these this imbalance is resolved is a cyclonic circulation will try to form. So that is a circulation that's rotating counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere. So something that looks like this. Now you showed in the gradient wind balance, or we showed in the gradient wind balance that uh, you can also have a cyclone that rotates in the clockwise direction. That was something that was uh, part of your homework assignment, and you showed the force balance behind that. It is theoretically possible to get a cyclone that rotates in the opposite direction, but it's very, very rare to have that happen. But it is within the realm of possibility. But typically, in your uh, typically in the northern hemisphere, you'll have a nice counterclockwise circulation with your cyclone. Again, you'll try to have warmer air going towards the colder air, and colder air trying to go towards the warmer air, again trying to resolve that imbalance between the tropical regions and the higher latitudes, the polar regions. And as this warmer air surges north, this typically results in the formation of a warm front immediately east of the cyclone, and you'll have an area of lower pressure here, and then you'll have a formation of a cold front as the colder air comes southward immediately to the west of the cyclone. And this is typically what a cyclone will look at in its infancy, right as it starts to get going. And then as this pattern continues, 
It turns out that cold air, of course, is much denser than warm air. So it's a lot easier for the cold air to come south than it is for the warm air to go north. It's really hard for the warm air to go into a colder region of the atmosphere. It's a lot easier for the colder air to penetrate into warmer air. So uh, typically what happens is this cold front comes down around the cyclone a lot faster than the warm front rotates around the cyclone. So at some point in the life cycle, the cold front will and warm front will be at about a 90 degree angle to each other. And a lot of times this is referred to as the maturing stage of the cyclone. And this is usually when the cyclone is at its peak intensity or close to its peak intensity. And eventually this cold air is going to eventually overtake the warm air. If the cold air keeps rotating around the low faster than the warm air rotate the warm front rotates around the low, and eventually this cold air is going to be begin to overtake the warm front. The cold front is going to begin to overtake the warm front. And this is typically where we refer to what we refer to as the occluding stage. And right usually in this occluding stage, when you have the cold front overtaking the warm front, you get what's referred to as an occluded front, and we'll talk about that in the next lecture when we discuss fronts. But typically that results in a lot of precipitation forming at this interface between the cold front and the warm front. And as the cold air continues to overtake the warm front, it eventually just cuts off the cyclone supply of, uh, of warm moist air, and this actually results in a weakening stage. So uh, sometimes you can get a new cyclone forming at this interface of cold front and warm front, but the original cyclone is going to be weak in the process of weakening once this cold front overtakes the warm front. And you get what's referred to as a occluded front, which is colored in purple here. So that's going to do it for this first segment discussing the evolution and typical life cycle of a cyclone and why they form. And in the next several lectures, or the next several segments, we're going to be discussing a little bit about the horizontal and vertical anatomy of the cyclone. So with that, I will see you all in the next segment.